My father said that I could say a few words before the, my lecture. And um, usually people ask me several questions. First of all, how's your mother doing? And then, um, anyway, she just wanted to send her love and said that she's attended so many conferences. And she's 93 now and, you know, will never be able to do that again. But um, she's been praying for the success of this conference and she said a rosary for all of you. Um, at 93, it's difficult for her to walk, but she's staying with my sister and brother-in-law and, I mean, doing as well as she can. And um, she just keeps saying, not my will, but thine be done. In other words, she just doesn't know how long God has for her. So we're glad she's still around. And, and every week, Father Francisco brings her Holy Communion. Um, the second thing people ask, okay, how's your book coming along? If I had nothing else to do but write books, then it would have been done a long time ago. But um, Father Francisco and I got most of uh, our new book. It's called uh, Counterfeit Catholicism and Masterminds of Vatican II. And um, it'll be better than our other books, but it just takes a lot of research, and um, we're planning to... Uh, finish uh, our part up by Christmas and then um, get it printed. Then it's on schedule because in 1994 we wrote What's Happened in the Catholic Church and then 2004, Tumultuous Times, so in 2014, okay, then it's the new book. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen. My dearly beloved in Christ, Ben was a valet to a southern gentleman. When his master died, friends told Ben that he had gone to heaven. No, replied Ben, I afraid he not go there. Why not, Ben, they asked. Well, when he go on a trip to Atlanta or to Birmingham or anywhere, he talk about it for a long time. And he get ready for a long time. But I never hear him talking about going to heaven. And I never see him getting ready to go there. My dearly beloved in Christ, death comes to everyone. There are no exceptions. No matter the times in which we live, nor the circumstances of our lives, neither the good or bad fortunes of the church, the political upheavals of the day, nor the advancement of science, none of these things hold any real importance when the supreme hour of death has arrived. I recall a letter my oldest sister once wrote to me when she faced a very serious life-threatening surgery. She wrote, it's strange how one day life is as usual, and the next day you're wondering whether you'll be dead or disabled. The imminent prospect of death puts everything in its proper perspective. If we wish to save our immortal souls, we must take a true view of ourselves, a view that is not distorted either by pride nor by spiritual blindness. This view should be a lowly one. In addition, we should take a true view of life itself, remembering that our life on earth is temporary, momentary, and passing. The next life, our true life, our e eternal life, begins when we die. Our great duty here is to glorify God and to save our immortal soul. Life here below, fleeting and fragile as it is, is a preparation for eternity. An eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. From my own experience, both before and since my ordination to the priesthood, the reality of death has always been before me. As a priest, I'm reminded of it almost every day. The saints tell us that the consideration of death is a very solitary one. With this thought in mind, I'd like to share some of these considerations gleaned from my own experience. When I was 21 years old and had taken my perpetual vows as a religious, received tonsure, and two of the minor orders, I had joyfully started my journey to the Holy Priesthood. I was with a pilgrimage group visiting the sacred sites in the Holy Land. There I became very ill. 
When I flew back home at the end of the pilgrimage, I knew something was seriously wrong. My twin brother thought I was just making it up, but two weeks later, he was struck with the same severe illness. After seeing many doctors, their conclusion was that both of us had only a month to live. Two doctors said there was nothing they could do to fix the whole series of serious medical problems that besieged us. The month, however, passed, and I found myself fighting for nine years to recover my health. As a result, my ordination of the priesthood was delayed all that time, and I was not able to become a priest until I was 30. There were other encounters with death for me and my twin brother. Once, when scuba diving off Catalina Island, we found ourselves 70 feet under the water at the ocean floor. My twin, who had just learned how to dive, had a weight belt that was too heavy and was grounded at the bottom of the ocean, unable to rise. He had to drop his weight belt and try to come up slowly. That was a serious problem because if you go up too fast, you get the bends, your lungs burst, and you die. We we're quite fortunate our lungs did not develop an embolism and explode. There just happened to be some paramedics eating their lunch on the shore. They rushed over and gave us oxygen. We survived the ordeal, but it was a close call. It wasn't our time yet. Over the years, I've received several death threats. One day, during the announcements at Mass, I told my parishioners not to accept propaganda and erroneous writings from misguided people and false prophets. After Mass, I went into the sacristy as usual, when suddenly I felt two hands around my neck in a chokehold. It still wasn't my time to die, though. I picked the man up off the ground and said, this isn't my time to die, so get out of here. Needless to say, he left in a hurry. Recently, I was talking to a woman who told me that while going through her sister's papers, she discovered that three months before her sister died, she had written down some regrets about her life. She had written, I didn't have my children baptized. I didn't teach my children the faith. I didn't do this, I didn't do that, and so on. Now it was too late, for she was dead. Her death was most tragic. While driving, she was hit by a forklift and died instantly. She wasn't given a chance to remedy anything. She is dead, judged, and is now in eternity. Some personal experiences have helped me to see death in its proper light. In Newhall, a local nurse used to come to Mass by herself, but later brought her family. One of her sons, not a practicing Catholic, stopped in for a visit. This young man was 28 years old, and he and I sat in the library and talked. I have a premonition of death, he said. I think that I'm going to die very soon. It seems from what he said that our Lord had appeared to him and told him that his life was going to be cut short. He asked me what he should do. I said the first thing I would do if I would be to go to confession. He did so, making a sincere act of contrition. He was very sorry for his sins before he left I gave him a miraculous medal. The young man then rode his motorcycle out to see some friends. While on the Hollywood freeway, a pickup truck was directly in front of him carrying a swing set. The set became dislodged and hit the young man who was killed instantly. Only 28 years old with the premonition of death. I think I was the last person to see speak with him. One Saturday morning, I received a phone call at church from a patient in Henry Mayo Hospital in Santa Clarita. I had to hear confessions and offer mass, but I told the caller I'd go out to see him as soon as I could afterwards. 
I went to the hospital and found a female Protestant minister in his room. She was the chaplain for the hospital. I said to her, so what are you doing here? This man is a Catholic. She left, of course. The sick man was not able to receive Holy Communion by administered the sacraments of penance and extreme unction and began the prayers for the dying. Just as I said the final amen, he passed away. If I had been held up after Mass, if something had happened to delay me, an extra signal, etc., that man would not have received the last sacraments. God truly blessed him. God does not, as a rule, tell us when we're going to die or the circumstances of our death. Some people die suddenly. Once a young lady told me that her father, who attended Mass at Queen of Angels, told her he was planning to go to confession the next day. He never got a chance, for God called him earlier. He was 76 years old and succumbed to a heart attack. He never made it to confession. He's now in eternity. Sun death is not uncommon, especially in our day and age. Any one of us may have a sudden death. Such a death is not a bad thing if we're spiritually prepared. In the Litany of the Saints, we say, From a sudden and unprovided death, deliver us, O Lord. If we're not ready, if we die unprepared, we go into eternity with no time to straighten things out. There's no second chance. That is why it's so important that we always remain in the state of grace, that we never commit a mortal sin. Often I travel and offer Mass in the surrounding areas of Los Angeles. Once, while in the South Bay, I encountered, among those who were there for Mass, several young men who were members of a gang. I told them, if you want to save your soul, you better get out of the gang. One of them, whose brother had been murdered, agreed and went to inform his companions that he was quitting the gang. Standing on the porch, he was gunned down without any warning. At least he was making an effort to amend his life, and God saw that. One man who came to Mass at our church went home and in the afternoon received a visit from his son. The two of them got into an argument, and his son shot and killed him. An older man in San Diego was stabbed to death by some drug dealers who were on his front lawn. He told them to move off the property, so they killed him. We tend to think these things will happen to someone else, but we never know when it might happen to us. It's up to us to live in such a way that death is not feared and that we're ready for it at any time. What about age? A 16-month-old boy in daycare was murdered by a baseball bat by an employee there. He went to the hospital shortly before he died. I told his mother, who was a Protestant, your son is in really serious condition. He needs to be baptized. Oh, I'll wait till he's 12 or 16 or so. I told her, only God knows if he's going to make it through today. If he dies unbaptized, you'll never see him in heaven. He will never be in heaven. She agreed. He was baptized and died about an hour later. Another family vacationing in Mexico had a four-year-old girl. The children were in the pool. The parents were on the side. The little girl had on a life preserver, which her little brother wanted. When he ripped it off her, she went to the bottom of the pool and died. Once I anointed a woman from Long Beach who was uh, 106 years old. Age doesn't matter whether 16 months, 4 years, or 106 years. Age is no guarantee. God calls us according to his plan, not ours. A traditional Catholic man from Santa Monica was annoyed at me once when I recited grace after meals with the family. I added the usual prayer for the faithful departed and may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. 
the prayer upset him. He said, I just ate, and I don't want to pray for dead people. Shortly afterwards, this man died of cancer. When I say that prayer now, I always think of that unfortunate soul who did not want to pray for the faithful departed. There's another incident which is rather amazing regarding the death of a 21-year-old la young lady. This person was not raised a Catholic, but was given an opportunity to accept the faith before she died. She was baptized and received the sacraments. A letter she wrote showed a remarkable and complete conformity of her will to God's regarding her death. Here was this young lady who had once had no faith at all, yet was given an opportunity to accept not only the Catholic faith, but her death as well. She totally cooperated with the grace of God and died in the same manner. Regarding the circumstances of our death, we can see divine providence work in many of them. A 72-year-old woman in the San Fernando Valley was dying of bone cancer, one of the most painful of all cancers. But she had nerve damage as well, so she felt no pain. God will never give us more than we can handle. We have to trust in his providence. The story of St. Demetria illustrates this wonderfully. Demetria was a very holy young lady living in the early ages of the church when so many Catholics were being put to death for their faith. She prayed, please God, I don't want to go through torture and martyrdom. But she was arrested and brought before a judge. Although terrified, no threat would induce her to worship a false god or deny her faith. If you persist in your folly, the judge threatened, this is what will happen to you. And he began to enumerate the various tortures in store for her. This is your last chance, he said. Will you renounce Christ? Will you renounce your faith? With the assistance of God's grace, the terrified young lady persevered in her refusal. Then an incredible thing happened. St. Demetria had a heart attack and died on the spot receiving the crown of martyrdom right then and there. God knew her, her limits and honored them. What about deathbed conversions? For conversion like that, prayer is required, very often accompanied with fasting, cooperation with grace, the green scapular, etc. One of the promises our Lord made to St. Margaret Mary to those who are devoted to a sacred heart is, I will give to priests the gift of touching the most hardened hearts. I've tried to practice this devotion for most of my life, and over the years, God al allowed me to witness many deathbed conversions. There was a 67-year-old man in Cherry Valley who had completely fallen away from the faith. His family asked me to go and see him. Although they really believed it was no use, they thought perhaps I could do something for him. Grace touched this man's heart. He had contrition for his sins and was truly converted. There have been others, a 92-year-old Protestant man, an 85-year-old man, a Jewish convert. In another case, there was a lady who was a very good Catholic married to a man who practiced no faith at all. I said to her, what about your husband? She said, oh, he'll never do that. Don't worry about him, etc." Nevertheless, I went ahead and spoke to him about the faith. He was very interested, took instructions, and was baptized. Then shortly afterwards, while stepping off a porch one day, he fell, which led to his death. God gave him unique graces, and he accepted it be before it was too late. At the same time, there's some very sad stories like this one. A 28-year-old woman, a lukewarm Catholic, although married in the church, it contracted what's called a mixed marriage with a non-Catholic. As often occurs in such cases, she fell away from her obligations as a Catholic. One of her babies shortly after birth was in very serious condition in ICU, and for some reason the woman did not want her child to be baptized, although he survived. Shortly thereafter, this mother contracted cancer 
She repented and tried to get back to God. The young lady has since died. But what was neglected for the spiritual welfare of her children, she will never have a chance to repair. It's important that we live in such a way that we are, we are always ready to die. There's no guarantee that a priest will be present when we need one or on our deathbed. However, we may pray for this grace because it's a wonderful thing to have a priest at such a crucial time. I remember on one occasion, Father Francisco was in the hospital because his appendix had ruptured and he was in really bad shape. The nurse told him that someone down the hall needed a priest. He said, I'm a priest. I'll go and see her. So first he put a stole over his robe. And then, although he was hooked up to a machine, he wheeled it down the hall and said, you might not believe it, but I'm a priest, and I'll hear your confession and give you extreme unction. So that dying woman had a priest when she needed one. A wonderful thing. This is why I'm always on call and try to make myself available as possible for those who seriously need a priest. Does a position of power help one regarding their death? A 39-year-old lady who was active in the city government used her influence to come to the aid of our chapel. This is how she helped. Bishop Blair, the Vatican II bishop for the San Fernando Valley, tried to close down our chapel in Granada Hills by getting the city involved. I was given official papers regarding a zoning violation, and it looked pretty bad for us. I contacted a woman I knew from city government, and she succeeded and getting the agency off our back. When she got seriously ill and her condition rapidly declined, I gave her the last sacraments before her death. Even though she was so busy and active in the Los Angeles city government, God placed her in a position to help us and then called, him, called her to himself. When we read of the death of Voltaire, we find that his circumstances were horrifying beyond words. The particulars of his last moments on earth are absolutely revolting. His last words were, I see the devil. Even Voltaire's own physician declared of his death, if the devil could die, his end would resemble that of Voltaire. I remember once visiting with the mayor of Santa Clarita. I said, is there anything I can do for you? I sincerely appreciate all things you've done to help our church. He said, yes, there's a member of the Santa Clarita City Council who's in really bad shape. Could you please visit him? I recall often seeing this man, a Catholic, at the city council meetings where only four or five people make decisions that affect hundreds, even thousands of people far into the future. The things they determine are very serious and many times cannot be changed. So I went to see the man at Providence Holy Cross Hospital. Here he was, one of the leaders of the city, now on life support. If one of the nurses were to unplug one of those machines or pull out one of the tubes, he'd be gone. The sacraments benefited this councilman and he recovered. What about material possessions? I remember going to see a seven-year-old lady who owned a very valuable car, a 1957 T-Bird. Her husband had been a devout traditional Catholic who had died about a year previously. The woman herself made her peace with God and then on dying had to leave her beloved car behind. As sh she was a member of an antique auto club. A large number of these very valuable cars were parked at the cemetery. I thought to myself, all of you are also going to leave behind these things that you hold so precious. Someone has said that life is like a monopoly game. Once the game is over, all the pieces go back into the box. Another person put it just as succinctly when he said that life is like a chess game. When it's over, all the pieces, kings, queens, bishops, and pawns, all go back into the same box. We have to realize that no matter what fortune is amassed, nothing is worth the price of our immortal soul. We have to leave everything behind, all our material possessions. 
We take nothing with us with the exception of our good works and the punishment due to our sins. We can leave our sins behind too if we make good confessions and atone for the temporal punishment due to our sins by prayer, penance, and acts of virtue. Sometimes it becomes too late to help others. There have been times when people have told me, my friend or relative is in really bad shape, but I don't want to alarm him by calling in a priest. I told them, if you're open to it, if they're open to it, then they should receive the sacraments and prepare for death. Several times I arrived only to find the person had already died because the family was afraid to call the priest. I can conditionally give absolution and extreme unction if the body is not rigid. However, the soul may have already passed to God. To wait until a relative or friend is dead or just about dead and then say, let's call the priest, is a complete lack of understanding of the importance and necessity of the last sacraments. I've ex seen extraordinary faith, fervor, and contrition in the conversions I witness. Some priests ordained for 50 or more years have never seen a deathbed conversion. It's true that such occurrences are very rare, and we can't count on it for ourselves. I remember talking to the son of a very devout traditional Catholic parents. Their son had about 24 hours to live. The timetable he was given was correct. That's all he had. A priest had tried to help him, but the son had refused and said, no, I don't want that. I don't need that. I tried speaking to him knowing that he had just less than 24 hours remaining. Sadly, he totally rejected God's grace and died, as far as we know, impenitent. They had to have a closed casket for him because his facial features were so horrible. The funeral directors themselves were shocked and didn't want anybody to see him. My dearly beloved in Christ, don't wait for a deathbed conversion. It may never happen. The chance you take may cost you an eternity in hell. I'd like to share a personal event that has deeply affected me. A short time ago, I went to the cemetery where my father is buried with some of my family members. My brother and I picked up my mother's wheelchair and brought it over to my dad's grave. And then we said some prayers. I began to ponder. There were four tombstones close to each other. One of them was of my distant cousin, Father Albin Radecki. He had been a priest for over 50 years, validly ordained, who had continued to offer the Mass for some time before caving in to the pressures of Vatican II. Now he sees everything clearly, exactly as it is. I can't help feeling that nothing should have kept him from doing what is right. Next to him was my grandfather, who died when he was 101 years old. Alongside him lies one of my uncles, Dr. Joe Radecki. He had been a traditional Catholic, but the pressure from others had been too much for him, and he returned to the new church. As a result, he became a bitter persecutor of not only members of my family, but even those of his own who were traditional Catholics. As with those who have died, he now sees things clearly. Next to him lie the remains of my dad. He had accomplished many things. He was an all-city basketball player, an extraordinary pitcher in high school, and did very well in his college classes. My father joined the Army and distinguished himself during wo World War II for the famous Battle of the Bulge. As a captain in the Army, he performed very well. He fought against Piper, the ruthless black SS leader, and defeated his soldiers. Later, he worked for Owens, Illinois Glass Company, the largest glass company in the world. He reorganized the entire company and made it more profitable. Dad was an international manager and an analyst, and they called him Mr. International. My father was light years ahead of everyone else. Sadly, he became anti-traditional Catholic and did everything he could to prevent my twin and me from becoming priest. Once dad entered eternity, saw things in their true light. What's really important and what's not? I can only imagine what his regrets might have been. Gazing at the four tombstones, I could almost hear them say, you were right. We can see that now. 
My dearly beloved in Christ, whether you have about 10 or 101 years to live, what's important is how you spend your allotted time. Your choices will determine where you will spend your eternity. Life, no matter how long, is only a flash. Death is final. There's no going back and no second chances to make things right. I have already spoken, my dearly beloved in Christ, about regrets. Do you have any? Your habitual sins. Overcome them and with God's help cultivate the opposite virtue. Your past sins. Repent and make up for them. The temporal punishment for your sins. Atone for it by good works and by the gaining of indulgences so that when you meet God, you're ready. If you're not ready to die, then amend your life. What does true amendment of life mean? It means avoiding all unnecessary occasions of sin. All unnecessary occasions of sin. Practice frequent fr prayer and acts of self-denial because prayer alone is not enough. If you don't deny yourself, you won't be saved. Go to confession and Holy Communion frequently. Continually cooperate with God's grace. Make a personal effort to remember your last end. As it says in Scripture, remember thy last end and thou shalt never sin. Remember your judgment at the hour of death. If you habitually keep in mind that after death you will be judged according to the justice of God, then you'll make good decisions and choices in life. Pray indulgence prayers, stop sinning, and correct your priorities. If glorifying God and the saving of your soul are not the number one priorities in your life, then you must put them there. Nothing is more important. The most important relationship in life is the one you have with God. If you have that right, then everything else will be properly ordered. How should we prepare for our judgment and death? We begin by the fruitful and frequent reception of the sacraments of penance and Holy Eucharist. Let's not take them for granted. There are many people throughout the country who live so far away from the Mass and the sacraments that they can only receive them rarely, if at all. Those who often have the services of priests can take this for granted and c become complacent regarding their faith. It seems to be that only when something is no longer available that it's truly missed and appreciated. To those who often have the opportunity of confession, it can become just another thing they do week after week or every two weeks or whenever it might be. Even the reception of Holy Communion, made without proper thanksgiving and or preparation, can become routine. Both confession and Holy Communion are vital to our spiritual life and must be done with proper preparation and thanksgiving. Of course, we must have true devotion to Mary. St. Alphonsus Maria de Ligori stated that a de devout servant of Mary will never be lost. Part of our preparation for death should be the practice of forgiving others so, th so that we ourselves may be forgiven our sins. We should also daily grow in supernatural charity, love of God and love of our neighbor, for charity covers a multitude of sins. Frequent prayer is our lifeline to God. Pray daily for the grace of final perseverance. Dear God, I want to persevere to the end. I want to save my soul. If we pray for final perseverance every single day, God will grant it. You can also pray as well for a merciful judgment. Dear God, please give me a merciful judgment. Although I'm unworthy, I trust in the mercy of thy sacred heart. Resolve like St. Dominic Savio to die rather than commit a mortal sin. It's far better to die prematurely if such is God's will than to ever commit a mortal sin. We can also pray for a sudden death if we're ready. A sudden death for which we are ready. A merciful judgment. These are things we can pray for, but we have to work for them and live accordingly. Then after we die, we can go straight to heaven. Isn't that something we should all desire and strive for? Of course, to do all this requires moral courage and persevering effort. 
St. Joseph is a patron of a happy, peaceful death. The doctor of the, of the church will place St. Joseph after the Blessed Virgin Mary above all the saints. According to them, he fills the place of Lucifer. But St. Joseph was granted far greater gifts and graces than even that apostate angel. St. Joseph is a special patron of the dying, and he's the most solicitous for his clients in their last agony. Numberless souls who have practiced a special devotion to St. Joseph during their life have experienced his help at death. At the hour of death, we're subject to untold suffering and anguish. At that supreme moment, every Catholic must undergo a terrible trial. And on God's final decision depends our eternal joy or endless torture. The fury of hell, the remembrance of our past sins, the uncertainty of the future, the pains of death, the terror of judgment, all these things flood the soul with fear and suffering. What saint could better defend us than St. Joseph, whom the whole Catholic world acknowledges as a protector, defender, and patron of the dying? St. Alphonsus states, since we all must die, we must cherish a special devotion to St. Joseph that he obtained for us a, a happy death. All Catholics regard him as the advocate of the dying who assist at the hour of death those who honor him. And this because of three reasons. First, because Jesus Christ loved him not only as a friend, but as a father. And on this account, his mediation is far more efficacious than any saint, aside from the Blessed Virgin Mary. Second, because St. Joseph has obtained special power against the evil spirits who tempt us with redoubled vigor at the hour of death. Third, the assistance given St. Joseph at his death by Jesus and Mary obtained for him the right to secure a holy and peaceful death for his servants. If they invoke him at the hour of death, he will not only help them, but will obtain for them the assistance of Jesus and Mary. It was revealed to a favorite soul that for days before St. Joseph died, hosts of angels came down from heaven to console him and to sing heavenly canticles. And at the moment of his departure, the holy archangels Gabriel and Michael, together with a host of other angels, came to receive his soul and bear it to limbo, where he was to announce to his forefathers the glad tidings of the approaching redemption. We can well imagine that Jesus poured out streams of interior bliss and heavenly consolation upon his foster father in return for all he had done for him. What love and solicitude the Blessed Virgin must have shown him. Both Jesus and Mary closed his eyes in death. Both shed tears at his departure. If Jesus wept over Lazarus, how much he must have wept over the death of St. Joseph. In the lives of the saints, we read many examples of St. Joseph appearing to them at the hour of death, sometimes bringing Our Lady with him. Let us daily ask St. Joseph to assist us at the hour of death, for he died peacefully in the arms of of Jesus and Mary. Like the father of the prodigal son mentioned in the gospel, St. Joseph loves not only those of his children who hear his voice and lead an innocent life, but he's concerned as well about his lost and erring sons. If with a strong hand he leads the just up the high mountain of perfection, he's also solicitous for poor sinners for whom his dearly beloved foster son gave his life. The Blessed Virgin once said to Venerable Mary of Agreda, On the day of judgment, the condemned will weep bitterly for not having realized how powerful and efficacious is the help towards salvation they might have had in the intercession of St. Joseph and for not having done enough to gain the friendship of the eternal judge. St. Joseph stretches out his hands to all who have fallen, if only they have recourse to him. Father Isolanus cites an example of St. Joseph's solicitude for sinners. A venerable nobleman had a pious custom of praying daily before an image of St. Joseph, but he did not keep the commandments of God. He contracted a serious illness. Day by day, he grew worse. Great fears were entertained for his recovery, but still more for his soul, which was in a lamentable condition. When all hope of saving his life had been abandoned, a heavenly physician appeared. The sick nobleman suddenly saw an aged man in the room who perfectly resembled the holy image 
before which he had daily prayed. The appearance of this heavenly visitor immediately dispelled all blindness from his soul as a ray of sunshine disperses darkness. Deep compunction and sorrow for sin filled his heart, and he made a sincere and contrite confession. The most remarkable grace that St. Joseph obtained for him was that at, that at the moment the priest had finished pronouncing the words of absolution, he yielded his soul, all cleansed from sin, into the hands of his creator. Numberless other examples might be shown of persons who for years had led sinful lives but were truly converted because he had persevered in venerating St. Joseph. May this give sinners confidence in St. Joseph and may they by his hand arise from their fallen state. They ought to especially inspire with confidence those who wish to bring a father, husband, brother, a dear one, or anyone back to the faith or to a virtuous life. I'll close with a poem. Life is short and death is sure. The hour of death remain obs obscure. A soul you have and only one. If that is lost, all hope is gone. Waste not your time while time shall last, for after death is ever past. The all-seeing God your judge will be, and heaven or hell your destiny. All earthly things will flee away. Eternity will ever stay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.